lights are bright. Good evening. Welcome. I'm happy to see all of you here this evening in this terrible weather. Uh, my name is Karen Lucas. I'm an assistant professor of teacher education and the chair of the faculty development committee. And on behalf of the entire faculty and staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the College of Coastal Georgia. This evening and tomorrow from nine to four during the day, the faculty and staff will share their scholarly work, including culinary arts, research posters, visual arts, and presentations on a wide range of topics. Our goal for this two-day event is to serve as a resource for the community and the students while creating a collaborative environment for faculty and staff to develop their plans for future scholarly work. Dr. Michelle Johnston, the president of the college, was unable to come this evening, but we are fortunate to have the provost of the college here to greet you. Dr. Johnny L. Evans, Jr. has been the provost and vice president of academic affairs of the College of Coastal Georgia for the past year, and it's my honor to invite him to open this year's Coastal Scholars Showcase. Thank you. Uh, that is bright. That is really bright. Um, yeah, I had to get my sunglasses on instead of my reading glasses. Well, good evening. Um, the president regrets that she cannot be here this evening, uh, but she sends, she sends uh, a warm welcome to you uh, uh, through me. It is my pleasure to officially open the Coastal Scholars, Scholars Showcase for this year, the second year, if I am correct. Is that correct? Second year that we are doing this. This is special. I've been in a lot of institutions that, that uh, needed to do something like this, but didn't. And this is a special place for us to recognize the work of our faculty and staff and our students for the scholarly work that they do. Tonight and tomorrow, there'll be multiple sessions. You've got these panel members up here. I don't know if we should be talking about politics as if this is a a debate or, or, or what we should be doing, but they'll take over that in a few minutes. Six panelists tonight, four poster sessions, art being presented, the scholarly work of the culinary arts students and their faculty with the presentation of the food that they will provide tonight. Tomorrow, 15 sessions with over 20 faculty presentations tomorrow. That's impressive. This work is done on top of teaching classes and doing advising and filling uh, fulfilling committee work and doing the work of the college that takes place. Our faculty and some staff are involved in engaging students in research in living out their profession. This is a big deal at institutions that are larger than us. There's institutions called Research One institutions that this drives the majority of what the, the work that is done. And so the fact that we have this level of research being done at a school our size is impressive. And it, it goes across many areas, through the social sciences, through the arts and humanities, through the sciences, through business, it, in nursing. It goes across all of our campus. It's not just focused in a single area. And you'll see scholarship done in very many different ways, but it's all scholarship and it's all important and valuable and advances each discipline. So I applaud the, the work of the faculty who are, are doing their own work and working with students. It really matters, and it changes our students' lives. I will tell you that the reason I went to graduate school was not because I made good grades, and it wasn't because I loved school. I couldn't wait to be done, but it's because I was doing research as a senior, and it changed my perspective on life and on education and on my field. And I wanted to be involved in that more. So when, when the opportunity arose for me to go to grad school, part of, partly out of necessity because I couldn't get a job, but partly out of a desire, I went and I loved it. It changed me and changed my perspective on the world. So I applaud your work. I would did a gratitude to the Faculty Development Committee uh, to the faculty, senate, staff assembly, coastal scholars for, for uh, uh, all the work that you have done, the library supporting your work. Everyone works together to pull off an event like this and to get the research done throughout the year in addition to the work of the faculty. So I hope you enjoy this evening. We're a young college and we're growing and we're growing in this area of research and it's improving by leaps and bounds compared to what our competition 
and our peer institutions do. This is a showcase tonight. It's a special evening for us to share the wonderful stories that have come out of the work that we have done and that, that the students and faculty have done together. And it's a wonderful opportunity for, for us to showcase all of your work. So thank you for coming tonight. And I'll turn it over now to the panel. Very good. So I'm, is this mic okay? Is it too low? Okay. So I'm Don Matthews. I teach economics here, and I'm up here with some really excellent people. And if you don't know them already, you need to get to know them. So um, why don't you, each of you, introduce yourselves, tell us who you are, where you work, um, who you work with, and what they do too. Okay, thanks, Don. My name is Tate Holbrook. I'm an associate professor of biology in the Department of Natural Sciences, which is uh, within the School of Arts and Sciences. And my primary role at the college is teaching and advising students uh, in, who are majoring in biology, especially the coastal ecology concentration, which I coordinate. Uh, but in addition to coastal ecology, our, our uh, bachelor's degree in biology has many different concentrations, including biochemistry, biomedical sciences, uh, general biology, secondary education for, for teachers as well. And then, and then our department also houses the uh, interdisciplinary environmental science degree too. And so we have a really uh, diverse set of faculty. There's close to 20 of us, uh, from biologists to chemists and physicists and environmental scientists uh, doing all kinds of, of great work with, with students. And, and students, of course, are our focus here. And so uh, we're, you know, all the, the programs and, and activities that we uh, conductor to prepare students for uh, careers in, in biology, in, in medicine, uh, environmental consulting, natural resource management, chemistry, uh, and, and many other kind of scientific fields. Uh, and, and we also have a lot to go on to grad school as well in, in biology, med school, vet school too. Hello, my name is Nada Moino Moki. I'm an assistant professor of psychology here at CCGA. I, uh, so the psychology program is located in the social sciences department and we have a quite unique department because we have people from various disciplines within one department. So we have a whole handful of psychology individuals or psychology faculty as well as as well as political science um, in addition to sociology. So we, we are a very unique department. Um, we do a lot of community-based research within our department as well as service learning courses. We do offer an internship course in the psychology program and I do believe that in our history program they do have these capstone honors courses they take and oftentimes they are doing projects that typically are somehow related to the community. So we tend to do a lot of engaged lear service learning within our department and it's something that is very valuable not only for a lot of our students but also for a lot of our community partners. Good evening, I'm Lee McKinley and I'm an associate professor of health informatics and for a lot of y'all will say, what is health informatics? Basically, it's the science of managing health information. Um, also work with our Bachelor of Business Administration, Healthcare Administration. We're part of the School of Business and Public Management. We have a very diverse group, I would say. Don, and of course, the fearless leader, uh, Skip Mounts. And um, we have degrees in, in Health informatics, they have the Bachelor of Business Administration with quite a few concentrations, accounting, marketing, I'm not going to be able to name them all, I uh, don't have them on my list, so I uh, don't want econ. to. Econ. Econ, sorry. Yeah. Economics, yes, we have econ. Um, we're growing concentrations from there. Uh, we also have the new Bachelor of Applied Science and Workforce Management, um, adding on some concentrations to that very unique degree in which we're able to pull for some of the graduates from their tech school systems to allow them to be able to get a four-year degree. It's, uh, it's really neat. Um, we also have the degree of uh, Public Policy and Management and and also criminal justice. And uh, later on, I'm going to mention a lot of different students that have just done wonderful things. Um, we're growing leaps and bounds, maybe faculty-wise, but we have a lot of students and they're doing wonderful things. We have service learning classes. Every single degree has an internship project in addition to maybe some service learning classes. So um, it's a wonderful you know, mix and I'm really enjoying. 
pretty good. You can yep. keep that That's one over there. Go ahead, Carol. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Carol Geiken and I'm the lecturer of special education and also the program coordinator for early childhood special ed within the teacher prep program. Um, through what I do for in our department, I teach special education courses and I also supervise teacher candidates who are out in the field doing their practicum or doing their internship. Our department is very small, but it's a growing department. And we provide several opportunities for our teacher candidates to be engaged in their learning through, through several different ways, through such as um, clinical classes, through field experiences, and also service learning. We want to provide opportunities for our teachers to make them able to be better teachers out there in the field when they leave us. Hi, my name is Nevada LeCount, and I'm an assistant professor of nursing. I teach within the School of Nursing and Health Science. Um, I teach within both the Associate and Bachelor of Science in Nursing programs. Um, our school has uh, multiple degree programs that we offer. Our newest degree will be a Bachelor of Science in Health Science um, that offers two concentrations in Health Promotion and Exercise Science. And they will be actually graduating their first cohort this May. Um, and on the opposite end of that, we have an Associate of Science in Radiological Science that just celebrated um, graduating their 50th class this past May. Um, and then we have our nursing programs. We have an ASN program that also graduated their 50th class, um, a Bachelor of Science in Nursing program, and an RN to BSN program. Um, all of our programs work within the community, um, doing clinical, doing service learning, and just striving to provide education and health promotion um, and excellent patient care. All right. Um, so normally they save the best for last, so I don't know how I ended up in this role. Um, <laughs> so my name is Cody Koki. Uh, I work in the Center for Service Learning. Um, so I was asked who we work with. So we work with any and everybody who's willing. Uh, most of the time it's a, with a lot of faculty. We provide faculty training and support. Um, we provide student support as well. Um, and also a lot of community outreach. Um, within our department we also do um, a little bit of marketing. Um, we try and institutionalize a lot of practices that are related to service learning. Um, and I'll talk about what service learning is here in a little bit, but we won't go into too much detail about that now. And I'll, I'll turn it back okay, over. Okay, very good. John. So here at the College of Coastal Georgia, teaching a course is our forte, but you should know there's a ton of scholarship that goes on here. And a lot of the scholarship is the standard academic sort of scholarship. So for example, we have an English teacher who's written a wonderful book on Joseph Conrad. We have a political science teacher who's written a terrific book on David Hume. We have a communications teacher who's, who's made award-winning documentaries. We have a public management teacher who's putting the finishing touches on a book on sustainability. We have history teachers uh, who have written books and the list of articles that our faculty have published in academic journals is a mile and a half long. But we also do scholarship um, of a different sort that we're really proud of because I don't think you find this at a lot of different schools and that's scholarship in which a faculty member is directly engaged with the community. So for example, we have an arts teacher who has been promoting the arts in the community for years, but he doesn't just promote the arts, he does it, including painting murals in downtown Brunswick and including the Welcome to Brunswick mural, of photographs of which are out in the lobby. Um, the dean of our School of Business and Public Management for a number of years now um, has been providing a forum for entrepreneurs and more important, even budding entrepreneurs um, to get together and share experiences and information and wisdom about what it's like to be an entrepreneur and what being an entrepreneur is all about. And there's no question that his work is contributing to the revitalization of downtown. And then along these same lines, we have, um, we have scholarship in which 
it's not just the faculty members who are engaged with the community, but it's faculty members and their students who are directly engaged with the community. And we'll be talking a bunch about that this evening. So when, when discussing the impact of a college on a community, what often comes up is the economic impact of a college on its community, meaning the amount of spending that's generated in the community by a college and its normal operations and the number of jobs that are generated by the college in the community. And for the College of Coastal Georgia, the most recent estimates are something like 100, bill, 100 million in spending generated in the community and in a year and then you know, somewhere around 1,200 jobs in total. Those numbers are all fine and well, but there's a problem with them, I think. And the problem is that it, it misses what we're here for. Um, what we're really here for is to help students live fuller, richer, more productive lives for the benefit of themselves and the community. That's what we're really here for. And I would argue that the impact of that, economic or otherwise, is far greater than those other numbers. Um, in other words, the greatest impact we have on our community is ultimately through our students when they graduate. So part of my job as moderator here is to rein in people up here who talk too much, and that includes me. So I'm going to kick this over to um, some of our panel members up here. Tell us about some students and some uh, success stories of our students after they graduate. Lee, would you like to start? Um, I would love to. Um, I asked my colleagues to uh, tell me about different students that uh, have made a, an impact on the community because, you know, I'm not familiar with everybody and you know, I was just overwhelmed with a lot of stories and I basically I had to pick and pull just a few to highlight. Um, I'm sure everybody has heard uh, the name Robert Mydell uh, who uh, got the criminal justice degree in 2016. He was a consummate student on the dean's list, SGA president, worked as a IT technician and a lab assistant. He was just everywhere. And he's still everywhere. Um, he works for the Glenn County Police Department and in 2018 his peers named him um, Officer of the Year. And I mean, just just a gem of a student, and, and is obviously making an impact on um, the community. Um, another graduate of ours, um, for the first graduating class of the BBA, Justin Henshaw. And if anybody's been to St. Simon and has seen that one of the newest buildings across from the airport, the, the Henshaw Group, um, hearing what he has done is just it's just awesome. Um, one of his uh, projects for a class, business class, he set up the first food truck in St. Simon. I did not uh, know that. It, it's not running anymore, but he is obviously successful in other things. He has got um, Island Sound, a DJ service that is all the way up the East Coast. I didn't realize it was that far-fetched. And um, Golden Isle Wedding Association, Fuse, Jimmy John's, um, I think the sky's the limit for him. He's just uh, he's, he's making quite an economic impact for a lot of people with jobs and just being a creative entrepreneur. Um, we have a 2016 graduate in hospitality, Rebecca Hayslip, who um, was a single mom and did great in school, got a great uh, 3.6 GPA, I believe, is what um, I was told him did a great job, and she was just recently promoted to the conference um, conference services manager at Sea Island. Um, so kudos to her. Um, our student accounting society student, um, are now taking on an endeavor with um, preparing taxes. I believe uh, Jim Benton probably can tell a whole lot more on that. Um, I'm not familiar with the company, whatever the organization, but I think that's just a wonderful opportunity to get out there to practice the trade and learn more about that. Um, and then with public management, we have Sean Boatwright, who is the deputy county administrator. Um, there's a whole lot more, but I'll pass it on to yes. others. Carol? Sure. You might need 
<laughs> yes, I'm very excited to talk about our success that we have with our teacher prep program. In fact, they, we, have be, we have been a teacher prep program now for 10 years. 10 years ago, we started the teacher prep program here at CCGA. And to this time, to this date, we've had 25 teachers who graduated from CCGA who was selected as Teacher of the Year, nominated by their school. But it even gets better because we also have a teacher, Tyler Mims, who graduated from CCGA, who became Teacher of the Year for Glen County School System. And I was just out at Tyler's um, class this past week because he is teaching fifth grade at Oglethorpe Elementary School, but he is also serving as a mentor teacher to our teacher candidates and to our interns. So he is making an impact on student learning. However, he's also making an impact on our future teachers for our district. Because we are finding that we have approximately 95% of our teacher candidates who have a job in Glen County. They stay or in the southeast region. This is where they want to be. They come here. And I have to say, as a director or a, as a program coordinator and also as a teacher of special education, and a lecture of special education that I work really intensely with our teacher candidates. And the passion and the love that they have for what they're doing is just so immense and so, you just wanna, it's so invigorating and so exciting. Um, and so I think we can celebrate that because we have students in our district who we, we are gonna have future teachers coming from here who are, will be making an impact on their learning. Very good. Nevada, do you? Um, so several of our students stay within Brunswick or in the coastal region um, and choose to go to work in uh, local facilities. Um, Southeast Georgia Health System is one of our biggest employers for our students after graduation. Um, some of our success stories um, Several of our students have gone into um, their healthcare facilities and made changes that are impacting patient care. Um, one interesting one is a student who realized that um, admission processes were not being streamlined and orders were being missed, which was causing harm to patients. And she was able to research and develop a checklist based off of kind of the OR style timeout checklist, if you're familiar with that, that was implemented on her floor and then adopted by the entire hospital and then adopted by the entire healthcare facility. Um, we have a graduate who was a former police officer before he decided to become a nurse and he's been able to marry those two careers and work for the Georgia Department of Mental Health and Disability. And he works as an investigator um, going into psychiatric facilities, making sure that psychiatric patients are being taken care of appropriately um, and that safety is being addressed. Um, a lot of our graduates are um, being awarded and recognized by their hospitals. We in nursing call those DAISY awards um, that our patients will actually nominate um, nurses for. I actually have a student that I currently work with in the hospital. She was nominated for a DAISY Award three times as a student, and then she finally was able to get a DAISY Award because she was nominated as a nurse this past fall. Um, so a lot of our success just goes in the patient care that our um, students provide. Very good. So um, as you all know, experiential learning is really important here at Coastal and experiential learning consists of all kinds of stuff from service learning to internships to clinicals and, and beyond that. And I have some numbers courtesy of Brian Weiss on experiential learning for our students. So over 90% of our graduates took at least one experiential learning um, or had some experience in experiential um, learning and an overwhelming majority of them found that experiential learning to be really beneficial um, to them. They really enjoyed it a lot. And so, Cody, service learning is probably the biggest part of that for us. Um, give us the lowdown on service learning. All right. Um, so you probably heard the term service learning a lot, and um, for some of you, you might you might be wondering what the heck is that. Um, so service learning is just one of the ways that we engage our students uh, both with their academics and also within the community. 
Um, so what service learning is, it's a teaching and learning tool. And so what happens in a service learning class is students are engaged in some element of service that is directly related to what they're intended to be learning in those classrooms. It's usually things that are um, a little bit more theoretical, um, a little bit harder to grasp unless you actually are out there physically touching those things, observing those things, or really interacting with um, some sort of population. And so what service learning does is it takes that academic component and that element of service to the community and it brings those two together and it forms a really, really nice way for our students to really see what these uh, kind of more um, theoretical concepts, how they play out in real world terms. And so that's kind of what the premise of service learning is. Um, and that's just, one, again, one of the ways that we use experiential learning here. Um, there's also um, things like internships. Um, we have a lot of students engaging in, in volunteerism too, which is also important. Um, not quite as ac academic. And I did want to share one example. Um, and I asked one of our faculty members to share one of her experiences. So I'm going to read a little bit because I don't want to leave out any really important parts of this project. Um, and again, this is just a paragraph about what's going on in the classroom. This can't encapsulate everything that goes on, but it's certainly a simplification of, of what happens in these service learning classes. So this was an English 1101 class. So as you can imagine, these are mostly incoming freshmen. Um, and you might think, you know, how can incoming freshmen engage in a way, um, in service learning in an important way? Um, but really what, what this professor has done, her name is uh, Emily Boyle. She works down at our Camden Center, uh, mostly. Um, she teaches some classes here as well. Um, but this was a, a course down in Camden, and the topic of the course was how can community build art? Excuse me, how can art build community? That sounds better. Um, so she says, literature is a fine art. So, trying, so tying in the readings and writings of the course in, to real world concepts and current events is very important. Students participated with St. Mary's Children's Theater, St. Mary's Elementary School, and the annual St. Mary's Scarecrow, Scarecrow Stroll. Uh, this is a hard one. Uh, so students said that with the St. Mary's Children's Facility, um, they reflected on the, a theater performance, the values of theater, and the community um, as well. Um, students working with the elementary school completed visual arts projects and participated with, arts, with the arts teacher, and also um, to help her display art, but also um, to help get that art publicized. And with the St. Mary's Scarecrow Stroll, uh, which is an annual event where businesses and other organizations design scarecrows down the main drag in St. Mary's um, and invite community members to come out, um, kind of like one of those trunk or treat things that you've seen, um, just a really safe environment for children and parents to engage with the community but also um, do their trick or treating. Um, and so we had students out there for that as well um, and they promoted um, both the concepts that they were learning in their classroom, but also the college itself as well. Um, and one student even completed a, a community food event in his neighborhood by promoting the culinary arts. And all students brought back their experiences into the classroom and were able to reflect and share those experiences and really talk about that topic of how that art helped build community. Very good, so how about some more examples? Let's just go down the road. Tate, do you have one? So in uh, Department of Natural Sciences, we're, we're, we do all kinds of experiential learning. You know, Don mentioned um, service learning and Cody and internships, uh, undergraduate research. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, as well as uh, we offer a number of field labs and field courses that take advantage of uh, and, and get students immersed in the, the natural environment of coastal Georgia. Um, but in, in this segment, I'll, I'll continue with a couple examples of service learning. Uh, so my uh, conservation biology class that I teach every fall, uh, we partner with uh, the St. Simons Land Trust and the Department of Natural Resources uh, on some conservation projects out at Cannons Point Preserve on St. Simons Island. And uh, the, the students get opportunity to uh, apply what they, they learn in the classroom and, and actually get to go out and do some real conservation biology uh, in the field alongside uh, professionals. 
Uh, and so we, we've got all kinds of projects going on, and it varies a little bit from year to year, but uh, one of the most longest running projects is uh, we are monitoring a uh, living shoreline, which uh, if you're not familiar with this uh, technique, it uses oysters and plants to, uh, instead of a bulkhead, to uh, stabilize a, a tidal creek bank and prevent erosion. And so we are uh, working with, with DNR and many other partners to help um, better, to help assess the, the ecological impacts of, of living shorelines so that we can uh, kind of guide their, their design and, and management uh, in Georgia. Uh, we're also, you know, monitoring um, populations of, a rare population of uh, red bay trees that mostly survived a, an outbreak of a lethal disease, and, and that work's attracted the attention of uh, the Georgia Forestry Commission and Forest Service and some researchers at University of Florida we've collaborated with out there on that as well, and, and other projects too, I could go on. But, um, you know, Cannon's Point is, is kind of a, it's, it's a living laboratory for us. It's where we go out and, and study coastal ecology, but it also gives us an opportunity to uh, contribute to these broader um, projects and, and work with these um, conservation agencies and, and, and private organizations who um, are working to protect, uh, sustain, you know, natural resources and biodiversity uh, here on the Georgia coast. Um, you know, one other quick example, you know, we have a lot of students who do internships and many of those also fit under this umbrella of service learning because they're working with uh, nonprofit uh, partners in, in conservation and environmental education as well as um, government agencies, you know, like the, the DNR, the Sea Turtle Center on Jekyll, uh, Marine Extension, Tidelands Nature Center. Uh, and so our students get to, uh, again, kind of, um, you know, help these, these partners to carry out their important work in the community while also gaining uh, experience and developing skills that are going to help them get a job. And, and actually a number of our students go on after graduation and one of their first jobs is working with those, those internship hosts. So the Department of Social Sciences, we are at the forefront of providing experimental learning opportunities for majority of our students. We have a lot of service learning courses as well as internship courses that are offered for our students and we have partnered with a wide array of communities within community agencies, so consisting of St. Mark's Towers, Head Start, Boys and Girls Club, Glen Environmental, and many more. I do want to kind of focus a little bit on what I have done last semester, just because it's much easier to explain something when you have that personal experience, and it was my first semester actually doing service learning here at CCGA, and I incorporated service learning component within my adulthood and aging class. I had partnered with St. Mark's Towers, and students were responsible for developing three um, recreational activities that promote healthy aging. And so students had come up with, the first event was a conducting, um, confronting stereotypes event in which students and residents talked about controversial topics. So LGBT conversations, politics, and it was interesting. Many of them, when they thought of this idea, came and asked me if it would be okay. And that was something that I took the learning opportunity for them and I said there's nothing wrong with talking about this and discussing it and just because they're older does not necessarily mean that they're not they're not at the they're not at the level to discuss this stuff. Um, and that was a very, very interesting session and actually after we had finished that session, the group has a Facebook um, page and someone had posted about how much they enjoyed the the discussion and they felt as it made them hopeful for the future generations because they saw how passionate students were about certain topics and that was very enlightening for students as well as for myself to see that they took it in a way that I had hoped they would take it. They also had done a arts and crafts event as well as a 1950s night with 1950s music and trivia and in the end both residents and students alike explained or reported to me that they highly enjoyed the service learning project and additionally they felt as though they learned a lot from it. Students reported that this helped them to confront a lot of their stereotypes and debunk many of the stereotypes they had about um, older individuals as well as it made them feel closer to their community and in fact after I finished the service learning project a couple of them decided to volunteer with St. Mark's Towers even after the project was over because they really did enjoy spending time there especially with some of the some of the residents um, were very funny and they um, would make a lot of remarks that students found found 
entertaining, and th so they developed <laughs> some bonds that um, that I wasn't really anticipating, so I think I learned a lot through that as well. Um, and some conversations came up where I thought I should kind of intervene, and I realized that, you know what, it's better for me to stand back and see how students are able to approach those particular topics. Um, so when I talked with the students, many of them, as I mentioned before, they got a lot out of it. Um, many of the residents actually Towards the end of the project, I had done a little focus study, and I'll kind of get into that a little later, but many of them felt as though this, this particular service learning project provide them with the opportunity to engage in generativity, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it is really the need for them to um, guide the future generation, and it is a developmental milestone for older adults, and that's something that they don't get very often within many of the residential facilities because oftentimes they don't get many young visitors. And so it really provided them with an opportunity to kind of give, give advice and help guide these students. And they were also just very, very hopeful for the future. And that's something that um, going into it, I didn't really think that they had, I didn't think they had these more of these negative thoughts about our future, but they did. And so they were hopeful with the things they heard from, younger, from the younger generation that they are interested in peace, they are interested in conflict resolution, um, and they are actually do have empathy, and I think that was something that had, was brought up quite a bit. So that's just kind of one example of the types of service learning that we see in the Department of Social Sciences. As I mentioned earlier, um, all of our degree programs require an internship, so I was excited to see on Brian's uh, first destination survey that the School of Business Public Management had 100% um, experiential learning. And we also use service learning with some of our classes, and I want to share um, a couple of examples here. Um, Heather Farley, who was uh, last spring, I believe it was last fall, um, the public management, managing state and local government, um, her students, had 10 students to work with um, the city commissioner Booker and um, the Neighborhood Planning Association for the ARCO neighborhood. And they got to work with census data and did um, a GIS assessment and produced a couple of documents for them that they shared with the Planning Association. And right now, there is a current community need survey that helps spark that. So if y'all see the link on Facebook, email, whatnot, take a minute to go fill out that survey. That is something that spurred that on. Um, their document has helped um, you know, promote a lot of work for the ARCO neighborhood. They used the GIS assessment to sit down with Georgia Power and um, discuss the lack of lighting and with the Water Commission to work with uh, sewer and flooding infrastructure discussions. And also sat down with law enforcement to uh, talk about their greatest uh, uh, crime issues. So a lot of work that these students get to put in on trying to revive a neighborhood that was once many years ago a very thriving neighborhood. Um, one of uh, the service learning classes that I did early on, we worked with Commissioner Booker and just trying to get a grasp on one of the Superfund sites over at the ARCO neighborhood with the LCP site and um, trying to determine you know, the health impact on it. Um, it, it, was, it, was, it was very eye-opening to watch the students. They, um, I would say half and half of my class in that particular service learning um, half of them were from the area and half were not. And it was just amazing to see even the ones from the area were not familiar with uh, the Superfund and the LCP. And it was, it was just a great learning experience and um, made them more, um, I guess, aware of community issues and become more driven with their education and how they can um, help make a difference. Um, I have done a service learning class of every, I try to do at least one in academic year. And for the health informatics students, it's, it's just awesome because this is a, um, a degree program that we're combining technology and clinical and business information. And their internships are really designed to try to show, you know, the flow of data to information in a healthcare organization and how it's used. And there's a lot of things that they, you know, they, we touch on in the classes that they may not get to do. So they got the opportunity to work on some very unique products, uh, uh, projects. 
Um, they got to prepare a request for proposal and RFP. Um, they did a time study with uh, the health clinics with the Coastal Health District and got to work with some just very unique projects. Um, very rewarding for them. They, um, they loved it. They, the surveys that we did afterwards, they were like, I have some students that are like, what are we going to do this year? So it's fun working with them to try to come up with some neat ideas and, of course, the impact on the community. Very good. Carol? We provide several different learning opportunities for our teacher candidates. One of our service learning projects was working with students at an after-school program. Our teacher candidates worked with individuals with small groups. Um, this was a win-win for all because our teacher candidates learned the importance of building relationships with students and how they could give students access to write a story, to read a story. This was powerful. At the end, the students, they felt successful. Their confidence grew. At the end, we had a big celebration. One little fifth grade boy stood up and he said, I just want to thank you for coming and teaching us every day. We also provided um, opportunities for our teacher candidates to be in the field and have a variety of experiences. When they come to us as juniors, they are in, they are in the practicum, first semester and second semester and third semester. First and second semester of their junior year, they are in the field two days a week, Tuesdays and Thursday mornings. Their third semester as seniors, their first year as seniors, they're in the field three days a week, and then their last semester, they are full-time in the field as internships. Um, also, the last couple years, we saw the importance of implementing clinical, mo uh, clinical classes where we front-load information here at the, at the college, but then we also go on-site to different elementary schools or middle schools and implement what we're learning and also continue on with many workshops. If I could, I don't think I use my full allotment. I'm going to interject real quick. I, I just thought of something you're talking, and you know, we're up here representing our departments and schools, but we, you know, at a, at a small uh, college like this, we don't work in silos, and so we um, we also do a lot of collaborative, interdisciplinary work as well. And so, you know, for example, some of the um, you know, my students and I and others have, have uh, collaborated between the sciences and education and teaching um, students to uh, take the, the work that we're doing at Cannons Point and uh, work that uh, James Demey's doing with students at a, uh, um, surveying a wetland at, at Oglethorpe Elementary and working with uh, Dr. Amy Sneed and her students to, to develop uh, K-12 lesson plans and curriculum that uh, can kind of advance you know, science education in the community as well. So I just, I just wanted to share that. It's a team. Mm -hmm. um, all of our students within the School of Nursing and Health Sciences um, have some sort of experiential learning experience, be that through their clinicals, um, their clinical internships or practicums is what we call that, um, and then also through service learning. Um, we do try to give our students a uh, wide opportunity. Um, a lot of people, when they think of nurses, they just think of nursing in the hospital setting. So we do try to give them um, an opportunity to see what nursing is like out in the community in different areas, hospice nursing, um, within the health department, dialysis nursing, and those sorts of things. Um, all of our students uh, do a service learning project. Um, most of them do multiple service learning projects. Um, and as they progress through the programs, they um, become more independent and more responsible for their service learning projects. So in the first semester, we may kind of guide them more, choose a population for them, and tell them, you know, this is kind of what you should be focusing on. And it's very interesting to see how they progress throughout the entire program. Um, so that in their final semester, they're able to choose a community, assess its needs, come up with a plan for that community, and provide education for them. Um, so, you know, recently, um, within the past couple of years, we've had some drownings. So, uh, one example of a service learning project is our students went into elementary schools and provided information about water safety. Um, also, uh, in a neighboring community, we had a middle school child who committed suicide real, um, due to bullying. So our students went into elementary and middle schools and talked about social media bullying and bullying um, in general. And we actually heard from guidance counselors at those schools that students had started reporting that they were being bullied um, and trying to get information about what they could do. 
Um, and they also, uh, in one instance, a student reported that they were thinking about self-harm. So it was very um, interesting to see how that service learning project potentially helped that student. Um, additionally, a lot of our service learning projects focus on um, educating staff, nurses, CNAs, um, throughout the community. What we're finding is in healthcare, um, patients are sicker, um, they stay hospitalized longer, and what was considered a critical care patient several, you know, even 10 or 15 years ago is uh, now a basic med surge patient, and that the nurses that are taking care of those patients don't always know about certain protocols, certain medications, um, and exactly how to take care of those patients. So our students have been able to provide training on those things um, to help improve care, to help improve nurses' comfort and staff comfort. Um, another just real quick example is our students um, noticed that, that a lot of nurses who don't do psychiatric nursing are very uncomfortable dealing with um, patients who have mental health problems. So they have gone into the community, um, into some of the Alzheimer's memory units, and talked to staff about appropriate communication techniques for those patients, how to, um, how to kind of diffuse situations with those patients. And they've also gone into the hospital. Um, the project was called uh, Mental Health Nursing for Non-Mental Health Nurses um, to help teach staff how to diffuse situations um, in those instances. Very good. So how about undergraduate research? Undergraduate research is really uh, becoming more prominent here. I know the, our psychology students really go after it full bore, but it's not um, just limited to our psychology students. So Tate, can you tell us a little bit about your Sure. Experience? So, so I approach uh, research as, as kind of an extension of my teaching. Uh, I'm, I you know, try to maintain uh, an active research program in ecology, not only to, to satisfy my curiosity as a scientist and stay active in my field, uh, also to, to try to um, help guide conservation uh, efforts in, in this area. Uh, but, but really more importantly for where we are here is to uh, provide students with opportunities to actually do science uh, and develop their, their skills as researchers. Uh, so that they are prepared to go on to, to grad school or, to, or, to the, or into their careers. And um, I know a lot of, a lot of other uh, colleagues in, in natural sciences and, and across the college you know, share that kind of uh, philosophy. Um, so there, there's, there's so many different projects, I, I can't you know, highlight them all in two minutes, but um, I'll give you a, a few examples of, of where uh, we've, we've done undergraduate research, you know, collaborative with faculty mentors and students, and, and also often with uh, external collaborators in the community, too. Uh, so one of those is uh, John Mayhas. He and, uh, he and I collaborated with uh, some folks at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center on Jekyll to uh, assess the, the threat of uh, ants that occasionally prey on sea turtle eggs and hatchlings. Uh, and wasn't really known how big of a deal this was uh, and what impacts it was having, and so we, we worked together to um, collect and analyze some data and, and ultimately found that while there are, you know, while red imported fire ants and invasive species I'm sure everyone's familiar with in southeast Georgia, occasionally they will feed on, uh, they will prey on or scavenge on uh, sea turtle hatchlings, but it's, it's not that big of a deal. Don't, don't run off uh, with the take home message that the, the sea turtles are, are leading to the extinction of sea, uh, or sorry, the fire ants are uh, causing the extinction of sea turtles because it's a, we didn't find any, um, impact on the reproductive success of the uh, turtles. But, um, but John was able to uh, co-author a, a publication kind of uh, to inform sea turtle managers about that work, you know, not only in Georgia, but worldwide. And uh, he's now uh, a grad student in, uh, at Auburn University studying entomology. Uh, another student who uh, also happens to be in an entomology program now at Purdue University, Katie Brill, uh, she, she also studied an invasive ant species. You're seeing a theme here. Uh, that's a new one, the Tawny Crazy Ant, that uh, she mapped its distribution in, in Glenn County and Camden County. This is a, a newcomer. Uh, it, in Texas, it's displacing fire ants, but uh, it, it has some problems of its own, so don't, don't get too excited. Um, and it's, for now, at least, it's limited to some sites along the I-95 and, and, and ports on coastal Georgia. 
but we expect it to spread over the coming uh, years and decades, and so we need to do more research to be able to, to understand and predict what its impacts are going to be you know, on the local environment as well as on the economy. And so that, that's a, a line of research that I hope to continue with other students. Uh, a current student we have who, who's really involved in research uh, is Cameron Atkinson. And he's actually a double major. He's doing uh, coastal ecology, which is a concentration of the biology major, as well as environmental science. And uh, he's, he's done some work with me. I mentioned earlier the, the living shorelines work out at uh, Cannons Point, and, and now we're starting a new project down at Honey Creek. Uh, so he, he's helped out with that, but he's done uh, independent research on uh, modeling oyster reef restoration and, and providing uh, some predictive models to help guide uh, oyster restoration more broadly. And, um, you know, he's right now applying for grad schools and, and, and you know, is a really competitive candidate. Uh, will probably have his pick of where he wants to go. And he, was, he recently received uh, the Nathan Deal Conserve Georgia Scholarship, I believe it's called. It's, there's only one statewide. He was selected by the um, Georgia Natural Resources Foundation and gets to go to Atlanta, be recognized. Uh, and so it's a, a pretty big deal. And, you know, um, it, it reflects not only Cameron's hard work, but, you know, being at a, a college like this to have uh, faculty to support doing that kind of undergraduate research, which we really value. Um, yeah, I could go on and on. Uh, you know, Dave Stasix worked with DNR to study uh, cannonball jellyfish and, and, and developing a turtle excluder device uh, for that fishery. Uh, and then we have a couple posters uh, after this, so I'll let you go and, and talk with uh, Dr. Dr. White and Dr. Hatchell about some of their uh, research with, with biology students as well. So the the Department of Psychology, or the program, excuse me, of psychology, uh, we do a lot of research with our undergraduates. We, we have a conference coming up, SEPA, which we, I believe we have about seven or eight students who are attending and presenting either posters or actually having paper presentations. I do know of two students who are presenting their papers. So um, oftentimes when it comes to community-based research, a majority of that research is integrated within our service learning courses. For example, last semester I worked with a student who was really interested in developing a foster grandparent program on campus, and that was what kind of pushed me to decide to do a, serv um, to do a service learning course with my adulthood and aging course. And while she was looking at the literature, she realized that there's, we don't have that much information on the impact that intergenerational service learning has on community members. We have a lot on the impacts on students. So once we started kind of looking through that, I told her, well, we can definitely conduct a study this semester, especially them we're already doing a service learning class on that. So in the end, we ended up doing a focus group at the end of um, the, the St. Mark's Tower service learning project that we did, and we, we had a lot of interesting findings, and there is a poster out there, so if any of you are interested in those results, please feel free to stop by. But um, that's just one example. I do know that um, other faculty members have done a lot of other types of research. So for example, Dr. Mercy Culley had collaborated on a service learning project with the Center for a Suitable Coast in which students developed a research study examining environmental attitudes, so community members' environmental attitudes. Um, in addition, Dr. Cam Karen Hambright had conducted a study with students in, the in her capstone course in which, she, in which they, they surveyed the local Hispanic community to understand why why they don't spray or neuter companion animals. So um, these are just a handful of examples that we do have. And the one thing that I think is pretty unique about the psychology program here compared to uh, my previous experiences in psychology departments is that um, many colleagues of mine start research projects because of students rather than forcing them to do research on what we're interested in. And I think that is, that is something that we don't see very often, and I, and I think that it really does help students get more energized for what they're interested in doing. And a lot of the students that I have done supervised research with end up going off to grad school because they're so excited about the research that they have done. So, and it does have direct impacts on the community. So it's something that I think for those of you who are thinking about service learning, you can do service learning and research, and that makes it much easier when it comes to thinking about evaluations, yearly evaluations as well. And it's definitely something that is very rewarding. Very good. Lee, how about uh, your OASIS? Um, I guess kind of going beyond undergraduate research, um, 
we tried to, we have, um, last spring we hosted a um, training for community and students for a tool that is provided by the Department of Public Health called OASIS, an online analytical statistical information system. Um, but just um, OASIS, we had over 10, uh, really over a dozen different organizations um, represented in that training. In addition to our students, we had some students from Georgia Southern to come and join us too. Um, but a lot of these agencies, you know, want, want to get answers to their questions and a lot of the students maybe, they don't even know what the questions are so it was a, a unique opportunity to find out what are the questions coming up out there and what data can we use to help answer those questions. And now we are collaborating with math to, uh, for their new data science degree. And we're hoping that uh, this semester we're gonna have another event where we're gonna invite community and we're gonna be looking at some more of these uh, data acquisition tools, um, sort of what we're calling it a birth to death summit, um, where we're looking at the community, we're gonna look at, you know, um, values of, you know, well, I mean, you think of the data the, of healthcare, it starts with the birth certificate and ends with the death certificate. So we can easily attain some of those from like the OASIS project. Um, but allow these students, you know, the health informatics students as well as these math students to try to develop data models to maybe to improve healthcare, identify, you know, causes of this and, and so maybe the community can come up with some additional programs to combat or complement and provide better health care across the uh, community. Very good. So our last little topic here is faculty research and so I would like to take this opportunity to sort of blow the horns of some of my immediate colleagues. So we have a little shop on campus we call the Reg Murphy Center for Economic and Policy Studies. And it's a total blast being associated with the, the center and the people in it because we are free to do what we want and our focus is on economic and social policy issues in this community and the six counties you know, of the South Georgia coast. So we've looked, we've done studies on um, the recession um, here and how the recession here compared to the recession in the nation. Um, we've looked at poverty. We've written a bunch of papers on local poverty, child poverty and poverty overall, trends in poverty, we, you know, what makes us different, what makes us similar to other areas. Um, this is an ongoing project. We work really closely with Virginia Brown of United Way. Um, we've done studies for different groups, Skip and Heather Farley and our friend Cliff Sowell, uh, did a thing for the St. Simon's Land Trust. Um, and in addition to all that stuff, which is really, really fun, and I think it's really unique, because you know, this is a little area. This is a small area, and yet here's this little research group that focuses just on this little area. I think it's a really unique setup. We also write take turns with a weekly column in the Brunswick News from the Murphy Center. And um, th this is real fun too, and it's extraordinary the amount of feedback that we get um, from these columns. And there's one that I really want to point to, which is um, an idea that my economics compatriot, Melissa Trussell, came up with, which is the four mile gap. And what Melissa means by the four mile gap is a big disparity in income and wealth on St. Simons and then just four little miles away in the city of Brunswick. And what's really neat about this is this issue of income and wealth disparities is a huge issue in economics and politics and it's usually examined at a global level or a national level. Well, the genius of what Melissa has done is she's taken this giant issue that seems abstract when it's that big and she's brought it right here. And she's shown us that it's right here 
in our own front yard. And of course, it's really controversial. There's lots of debates going back and forth, which is part of the fun of it. Um, and so what we're doing this summer is, well, and we've sort of started it now, is we're expanding this project. We're going to look at um, how unique or how common this is to have this, these great disparities in income and wealth so close together. You know, is, are we unique in this or is this very common? You know, what causes it? That sort of thing. So we're going to do, do a bigger study on this and we're enlisting a student an econ concentrator to help us with this. So it's really exciting. And um, so with that, we're, we're sort of out of time. So thank you all for coming. Um, Karen's going to come back up and wrap things up for us. OK, I want to thank the panel for sharing such wonderful information with us, their insights about their various projects. Let's show our appreciation for the panel. <laughs> Um, I also want to remind you that tomorrow from 9 o'clock in the morning to 4 in the afternoon, you can look at your uh, programs to see all of the sessions that will be going on here in this building down the hall, just behind this wall, uh, all day tomorrow. Please join us at that time. And I, of course, want to invite you to now join us in the lobby for our reception. Um, the, the culinary arts program has prepared food and beverages to show their scholarship. And then off to the right as you exit this, these doors will be um, visual arts and some research posters to enjoy. Um, so appreciate you all coming tonight. And please join us for the reception in the lobby.